Thank you, Holly, for reading 1 Peter 4, 12 and 14, and 5, 6 through 11. Today we're talking about the grace of humility. We've been hearing the testimonies of hope last week and, and more this week, people sharing about where they find hope during these times. And, you know, there are times that we find hope when we're just watching television. Uh, one of my favorite shows is America's Got Talent, and they're getting ready to start a new season this coming week. And I saw it promoted on, online today, and they showed a man who came to audition, and he was a singer. And he came on the stage, and they asked him his name. He said he was Archie Williams. And then they asked him, what's your story? And he took a few moments to pull himself together, and then he shared that he had recently gotten out of prison. He had been there for 37 years, and he had been there because he had been falsely accused of raping a woman. He was a black man, and he had been accused of raping a white woman 37 years ago. And even though people testified that he was in a different place and all of that, he was still convicted and he was sent to life in prison, in a notorious prison in Louisiana. And after 37 years, he was released because new technologies and new ways of uh, checking things out discovered that someone else had raped that woman. And yet he came talking about how music had been his hope. And they even showed videos of him singing, uh, probably in a worship setting, in, in, in prison. And then he began to sing, but you could tell in his sharing his story and also in his singing, you could see a grace that was also humble. We see this in other people. It reminded me of Nelson Mandela, who spent 27 years in prison and came out and had the grace and the humility and the ability to move a nation out of apartheid as the first black president of South Africa. Also, along with him, working side by side, was Archbishop Desmond Tutu, someone that I actually heard speak back in the mid-80s while apartheid was still in power in South Africa. Desmond Tutu, a brilliant man, well-educated, and yet was not allowed to vote in his own country because of his race. And later on became someone who not only impacted South Africa, but other countries as well with the understanding that comes from scripture of reconciliation. Anne Lamott tells a story of, of gracious humility as she was struggling with uh, a mole a mole that was, she was worried about and the doctor was checking out and she went to church and she was just so worried that she wanted to go and she wanted to pray and she wanted to meet up with someone and there in church was a woman whose daughter was struggling with a devastating heart condition. And that woman said to Anne, oh, I know that mole must really worry you. I know that your father had skin cancer. Let me pray with you. And Anne was just overwhelmed by this woman and her gracious humility when her daughter had this horrible, horrible ailment. And she could be sensitive enough and caring enough to care about Anne's mole. The grace of humility. 
This is something that we see in this passage. In the verse right before the section on humil humility that we read in, uh, chapter, in chapter 5, in verse 5 we read a quote from the, from the Proverbs, Proverbs 3, 34. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Right before that, he talks about this garment of humility. Clothe yourself with humility. And this word that is used for this garment, to clothe yourself in humility, can have two understandings. One of them is this apron, an apron that was worn by servants. And you can imagine that Jesus put on this kind of apron as he wrapped the towel around him and he washed his disciples' feet. Another, another image that comes from this garment, though, is a robe or a stole that is put on you, put on a person as an, a form of honor. And so you have this image, this double image, that is a garment that not only is that of a servant, but that of one who is honored. Put on this garment of humility. And this is how we are to be with one another and with God. Now remember the context. The context of this book as this letter is being written is being written by people who are persecuted in Rome, writing a letter of encouragement and hope to the people who are being persecuted in Asia Minor. They're suffering. And in fact, this section that we read starts out with this idea of do not be surprised at this fiery ordeal as if something strange were happening to you. Suffering happens. Now, in their case, it was a constant of their days. But suffering happens. It happens to all of us. Sometimes it's big and sometimes it's little. It, sometimes it comes from persecution, but other times it comes from various life circumstances, economic uh, relationships, grief. But suffering happens. It happens to all of us. And that's the reality. The reality is that suffering happens. It's unfair. It's never fair that we have to suffer, especially if we're suffering because we're doing good and doing the right things. And suffer ha suffering happens unfairly. Some people suffer a lot and some people don't suffer as much. And it doesn't seem to be doled out in any kind of fair way. But the message here is that Jesus suffered. And if we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to suffer too. A reminder, don't suffer for doing wrong. If you're going to suffer, suffer for doing right and doing good. And we talked about that in past weeks as we've been looking at the book of 1 Peter. But the writer is now telling these people to live in humility. Let humility be a quality of your character. Be humble. Have gracious humility. Clothe yourself with humility. This is the lifestyle that he's calling even people who are suffering. Now, clothing yourself with humility, at first you think of something as being uh, passive and, and weak. But in fact, humility is a strength. Humility is a choice. Humility is courageous. And so when we're called to 
clothe ourselves with humility, there are three dimensions to this humility. First of all, we are called to trust God. This humility is trusting God. In other words, okay God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to put this in your hands. When you're suffering or when you're struggling or when you're anxious, we say, okay God, you're God. I'm going to trust you. And we see two different aspects of God. We see the mighty hand of God, the mighty hand of God that created this universe. The mighty hand of God, a God that we can't even understand because God is so big. But also this mighty God, this God that created the universe is also a God that cares for us. We're told to cast our anxiety on him, on God, because God cares for us. This was unusual, an unusual concept to the Romans because Roman gods had all different kinds of powers. They believed that these gods were fighting each other. They would battle each other. They would compete with each other and try to outdo each other. And these Roman gods didn't necessarily care about people. They would deal with people according to their own self-interest, but people weren't that important to them. You couldn't count on the fact that gods cared for you. And so this was really different. This was different to follow Christ and believe in a God that cares for you. Even though this God is the most mighty, the most powerful in the universe, this one God. Trust God. That's part of humility is knowing that we're not God. It's not my job. It's God's job. And I'm going to trust God in what's going on. The second is respecting others. It's not all about me. Asking ourselves, what can we learn from each other? And we see this as it's shared in the, in, in the fifth chapter of 1 Peter. It talks about leaders and elders, those who have been Christians for a long time, to be humble and respectful of their students, of those that are younger and, and uh, new at all of this. And also to the student, to the younger ones, to respect and be humble before their elders. In a community that, unlike the rest of society, was mutual and egalitarian, this idea of humility and respect was a key element of this kind of community. And then the author takes it one step further and says, remember that you have brothers and sisters all over the Mediterranean that are also suffering. There's something about humility that says, I know I'm suffering, but I'm not the only one. It's not all about me. And even in my suffering, I find myself in myself the ability to empathize and be compassionate for someone else who is suffering, even if they're suffering more than me or they're suffering less than me. In our suffering, humility helps us find what it takes to be compassionate for someone else who is struggling. And finally, taking evil seriously. That's a part of humility too. Taking evil seriously, not just brushing it off, not thinking that it has nothing to do with me, not trying to avoid it or trying to uh, ignore it, but taking evil seriously. It's real.
And when we take evil seriously, we live a life that is disciplined, that is alert, that is steadfast in faith and strong and willing to stand up against evil. The one who clothes themselves in humility does this in order to stand up against evil, evil that might harm someone else evil that goes against the way God wants the world to be, the kingdom of God. A lot of times we're tempted to give up when we face evil. A lot of times we maybe even resort to evil tactics. Or maybe we're tempted to just look at our own selfish interests and not think about anyone else. Well, that evil's not affecting me, so I'm not going to I'm not going to go there. But we're called to take evil seriously, and that's part of putting on this garment of humility. Realizing that this is what God calls us to do. Even if we're suffering, even if we're struggling. And so we're called, in good times and bad, to put on this garment, this cloak, this shawl, this apron of humility. To be gracious and humble. We clothe ourselves with humility by trusting God the God of the universe, the God with his mighty hand, but the God who says to us, cast your anxiety on me because I care for you. This humility also respects others, respects people and loves them and is compassionate sees what they have to offer the community and appreciates them, knowing that it's not all about me. And finally, this kind of humility takes evil seriously, seriously enough to do the things in our lives in order to build ourselves up to withstand the evil around us and to care for the people around us who are impacted by it. Clothe yourself with humility and God will give you grace. Let us pray. Our God, we thank you so much that you love us and we pray that we can live in humility, that we can know your grace, that people will see us as graciously humble people who seek only to serve you and to love others and to fight evil. We thank you. We pray that you will empower us to live this kind of life. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.